Honorable, Honorable Acting Chief Justice of the Republic of South Africa, Justice R. M. M. Zondo, Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable N. N. Mapisa Nakula, MP, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honorable A. N. Masondo, MP, Honorable Judges President, Years of Superior Courts and other judges, leaders of the regional courts, leaders of the district courts, other members of the judiciary, chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services, Honorable G. Magwamishe, MP, chairperson of the Select Committee on Security and Justice, Honorable S. Shai, MP, Secretary of Parliament, Ms. B. Chawa, Secretary General of the Office of the Chief Justice, Ms. M. Sejosinwe, and officials of the OCJ, Director General of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, Advocate D. Mashabani, valid stakeholders of the judiciary and members of the public who are watching these proceedings on the social media platforms of the judiciary and by other means, and members of the media who have joined us on this virtual platform, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning um, to everyone. It is my pleasure to welcome all to this special occasion, the fourth Judiciary Day. It is generally accepted that judges account to the public through their judgments. The heads of court have, however, in order to give effect to the judicial norms and standards, understood that measures had to be put in place to ensure that the public was given an insight on how the judiciary as an arm of state was performing. This accountability process also provides the public with the opportunity to be assured of the independence of the judiciary. At the outset, I need to acknowledge former Chief Justice Mokwe Mokwe for his visionary leadership, which ensured that a dispensation is uh, developed by which the judiciary can account to the country. The heads of court, under the leadership of the former Chief Justice, resolved that a framework through which information relating to court performance will be collected, collated, and compiled in a report had to be developed. The first step was to establish a committee of judicial officers supported by officials of the Office of the Chief Justice to oversee the data gathering process that will culminate in the production of a report and to host the Judiciary Day. The committee, known as the Judicial Accountability Committee, was established. Guided by the collective wisdom of the heads of court, I am leading the committee as chairperson and have done so for the past three years. Reflecting on the period since the establishment of the committee, it is important to highlight some of its achievements, namely the development of a draft judicial accountability framework, which was subsequently adopted by the heads of court. Development of judicial performance indicators with a description and method of calculation defined. Develop targets for each judicial performance indicator and ensure provision tools to be used to collect data from and to assist heads of court with the compilation of the report for monitoring purposes. The committee is also responsible for the development of the annual report and for organizing the Judiciary Day event. I am proud that the committee has been able to deliver on all its goals. A challenge for the committee is that the judiciary does not have a fully automated system to collect data from all courts. Measures are being put in place to address this challenge. 
I am pleased to announce that a draft strategic plan for the judiciary has been developed and it is, in, it is work in progress going through the final stages of refinement. The strategic plan for the judiciary will require sufficient funding for proper implementation. We anticipate a discussion with, a responsible, uh, with those responsible for public press to uh, release funds that will ensure that the judiciary is provided with the necessary tools to fulfill its constitutional mandate. We are in dire need of a world-class court automated system. I thank my fellow committee members for their undivided support without which we would not have been able to deliver on our mandate. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my honor and privilege to introduce the Acting Chief Justice RMM Zondo, who will present the Judicial Annual Report for the 2021 financial year. I thank you. Program Director, Judge President Monica Liu, Chairperson of the Judicial Accountability Committee, Speaker of the National Assembly, Honorable Ms. Nosiviwe Mapisa Nakula, Chairperson of the National Council of Provinces, Honorable Mr. Amos Masondo, Judges President, Heads of our Superior Courts, and other judges, leaders of regional courts, leaders of our district courts, other members of the judiciary present, chairperson of the Portfolio Committee on Justice and Correctional Services, Honorable Mr. Makwanishe, Chairperson of the Select Committee on Security and Justice, Honorable S. Sheikh. Secretary to Parliament, Ms. B. Jawa. Secretary General of the Office of the Chief Justice, Ms. M. Sujosengwe, and officials of the OCJ present. The Director General of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development, Advocate D. Mashabane, valued stakeholders of the judiciary and members of the public following these proceedings on the social platforms of the judiciary and by other means. Members of the media who have joined us on this virtual platform, ladies and gentlemen, Good morning to all of you. In 2018, the judiciary of South Africa held its first ever judiciary day and presented to the public the first ever judiciary annual report through which the judiciary accounts to the public for the performance of its judicial functions. That was for the period from 1 April 2017 to 31 March 2018. Since then, the, the presentation of the Judiciary Annual Report to the public by the leadership of the Judiciary on Judiciary Day has been an annual event. This year is no exception. These historic developments happened under the leadership of Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng, ably assisted by the collective leadership of the judiciary of this country. 
Reflecting on the period prior to 2018, Chief Justice Mohueng Mohueng explained in the inaugural edition of the Judiciary Annual Report, and I quote, the leadership of the higher courts analyzed the situation from a constitutional perspective, identified the inappropriateness of accounting the traditional way and resolved to delink the accounting responsibilities of the administrative office, the office of the chief justice from those relating to court performance, which is a shared section 1656 responsibility of the judiciary. While we acknowledge that judicial independence is inextricably linked to judicial accountability, we are satisfied that we bear a direct responsibility to account to the nation ourselves." Close quotes. The Chief Justice retired from active service on 11 October 2021, after a long and illustrious career of dedicated service to this country. This report and the attendant culture of direct accountability is one of his many legacies. I take this opportunity to thank Chief Justice Mokweng Mokweng on behalf of the judiciary of this country for his great leadership of the judiciary over a period of 10 years. I thank him too for the enormous contribution he made during his term of office as Chief Justice to the building of a strong, independent, effective, and efficient judiciary. We have chosen today as our judiciary day for this year. We regard judiciary day as very important because it gives us an opportunity to account to the public and we take accountability very seriously. We believe that when we account to you, the people, our legitimacy as the judiciary is enhanced and the trust you have placed in us is deepened. The basis for this belief is a clear understanding on our part as the judiciary that the judicial power we have and exercise is derived from you, the people, who have given it to us through the Constitution. In this regard, President Mandela had this to say to the first judges of the Constitutional Court on the occasion of the inauguration of the Constitutional Court, and I quote, your tasks and responsibilities, as well as your power, come to you from the people through the Constitution. The people speak through the Constitution. Close quote. On Judiciary Day, we come before the people of South Africa to account for how we have performed our judicial functions. To talk about how many cases we have had, how many of those we have finalized, how long it has taken us to finalize them, and what backlogs there are in our courts. Section 1656 of the Constitution of the Republic of South Africa, read with Section 82 of the Superior Courts Act, 
provides that the chief justice is the head of the judiciary and exercises a responsibility over the establishment and monitoring of the norms and standards for the exercise of judicial functions for all courts. The Superior Courts Act stipulates that the management of the judicial functions of each court is the responsibility of the head of that court. The judge president of the division of the High Court is also responsible for the coordination of the judicial functions of all magistrate courts falling within the jurisdiction of his or her division. The heads of the various courts will manage the judicial functions and ensure that all judicial officers perform their judicial functions efficiently. The Chief Justice and the heads of court have established subject matter committees that evaluate and recommend strategies and guidelines on all aspects of judicial administration in order to fully prepare it for a judiciary-led court administration. The heads of court designate and mandate judges to serve on these committees. These committees are assigned to strategize on such matters as judicial case flow management, court performance reporting, digitization, automation and technology, and court efficiency on both a national and a provincial level. Modernization of the courts and digital transformation initiatives remain crucial for improving service delivery. As part of court modernization, court online was partially implemented with the rollout of case lines at the Gauteng Division of the High Court. The judiciary was not spared from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on its operations and had to quickly adapt to the new normal and switch from physical to virtual court proceedings and operations. We are grateful to the Office of the Ch Chief Justice for managing this difficult transition as well as they have done under the trying circumstances of lockdown. The 2020-2021 performance plan for the judiciary has been developed. It defines and identifies performance indicators and targets for the various courts. The performance indicators and targets are measures that allow for the monitoring of performance on one or more aspects of the overall functions and mandates of the judiciary. The 2020-2021 performance plan for the judiciary sees the introduction of new performance indicators and targets as determined by the judiciary itself. These include indicators on the finalization rate of applications and petitions in the Supreme Court of Appeal, the finalization rate of appeals in the Labor Appeal Court, and the introduction of new measures on the reduction of the percentage of criminal 
trial backlog cases. The following legislative framework supports an accountability mechanism for the South African judiciary. The Constitution, the Superior Courts Act of 2013, norms and standards for the performance of judicial functions, Judicial Service Commission Act 1994 and its regulations, disclosure of judges' registrable interests, Judges' Remuneration and Conditions of Employment Act of 2001 and its regulations, the South African Judicial Education Institute 2008. It is important to note that as contemplated in Section 8.3 of the Superior Courts Act of 2013, the Chief Justice may issue protocols or directions or give guidance or advice to judicial officers. A, in respect of norms and standards for the performance of the judicial functions as contemplated in subsection six. B, regarding any matter affecting the dignity, accessibility, effectiveness, efficiency, or functioning of the courts. It is now appropriate to highlight certain features that are to be found in the Judiciary Annual Report. The targets of finalized matters and the actual performance of the courts. Constitutional Court. The Constitutional Court had set for itself a target of 70% of finalized matters. It had 445 matters and finalized 273 of those. That was a 61% performance. Although it fell short of its target, there was a 10% increase in its caseload. The Supreme Court of Appeal. The Supreme Court of Appeal had set for itself a target of 80% of finalized matters during the period under review. It had a total of 241 matters and it finalized 196 of those. That was an achievement of 81%. In regard to its applications or petitions, it finalized 99%. It had a 1% overachievement in regard to a finalized matters. Divisions of the High Court. Divisions of the High Court had set for themselves the target of 75% of finalized criminal matters, and they achieved 85%. The various divisions of the High Court had a total of 11,413 criminal cases, and they finalized 9,749 of those cases. That translated to 85%. That was a great achievement. They exceeded their target. They had set for themselves the target of 64% finalized civil matters. They had a total of 83,080 civil cases and finalized 69,908 of those cases. That translated to 84%.
That means that divisions of the High Court exceeded their target by 20% in this regard. That was a pleasing performance. They also set for themselves the target of reducing the percentage of criminal trial backlogs to 30%. They were not able to achieve this target, but they reduced the percentage of criminal trial backlogs to 41%. They were 11% short of their target. Specialist courts, the Labor Court and the Labor Appeal Court had set for themselves the target of 58% finalized labor matters. They were unable to achieve that target, but they achieved 52%. They had 4,168 cases and finalized 2,188. The Land Claims Court had set, set for itself the target of 60% finalized matters. It had a total of 149 cases and finalized 108 of them. That translated to the achievement of 72%. That was 12% above the target. The Competition Appeal Court had set for itself a target of 85 finalized matters. It had a total of 10 cases, and it did all of them, and therefore achieved 100% which was 15% above the target it had set for itself. The electoral court had set for itself the target of 90% finalized matters. It received a total of nine cases, all of which it did, and therefore achieved 100% of finalized matters, which was 10% above the target it had set for itself. A reduction of criminal backlogs in the divisions of the High Court. All the divisions of the High Court had set for themselves the target of reducing their backlogs of criminal trials to 30%. However, many of the divisions failed to achieve that target, only about three divisions of the High Court managed, managed to reduce the backlog of criminal trials. Reserved judgments. All super, superior courts had set for themselves the target of 70% finalized reserved judgments. They collectively exceeded this target by 8% and achieved 78 finalized reserved judgments. The Superior Courts had 4,526 reserved judgments and they delivered 3,511 reserve judgment with the judgments within three months. The leadership of the magistracy for both the regional courts and district courts identified and adopted performance indicators which will allow reporting on the court performance of the magistrate's courts. This was a significant step in ensuring that the judiciary as a whole accounts to the public for its performance and also allows the head of each court to manage 
court and judicial performance to ensure the efficient and effective running of the courts. For the collection and collation of the performance information relating to the magistrate's courts, the judiciary relies on the integrated case management system of the Department of Justice and Constitutional Development. As a result of the well-known and most unfortunate system failure caused by an ICT security breach in the Department of Justice and Correctional Services, the leadership of the magistracy resolved that the performance information for the reporting period should not be published. The heads of the superior courts supported this decision as the accuracy of the performance information could not be tested. Gender transformation in the judiciary. We have made substantial progress in the gender transformation of the judiciary, but we have not reached the right level of representation of women in the judiciary. At the end of the reporting period under review, the establishment for judges comprised 234 judges in active service. 44% of those judges are women. The number of magistrates in active service is 1,726, of which 49% are women. Judges discharged from active service. 11 judges were discharged from active service during the reporting period, and no judges resigned. No new appointments were made during the reporting period due to the fact that the Judicial Service Commission could not conduct interviews. There was, as a result of the lockdown measures implemented as part of, this was as a result of the lockdown measures implemented as part of the declaration of the national state of disaster in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Judicial education and training. Continuous training and development of our judiciary is essential and is undertaken by the South African Judicial Education Institute. A total of 123 judicial education courses for judicial officers were conducted during the period under review. And the causes were attended by 3,297 delegates. Due to the country's lockdown and related regulations, the OCJ had to leverage new technologies by conducting some of these educational causes virtually as a measure to ensure continued judicial education. Sadly, 10 judges also passed on during the reporting period. We remember our departed colleagues and we thank them and their families for their service to the people of this country. Gender-based violence. Before I conclude, let me say a thing or two about gender-based violence. Every year during the Women's Month, namely August, or during 
the 16 days of activism, activism against violence against women and children. There is an incident that seems to remind us of how just horrific and dangerous this country has become for women and children. And that makes the promise and purpose of both these two periods feel depressingly hollow. This year, it was the murder and dismemberment of Ms. Nosotelo Mtebeni, whose boyfriend murdered her after fly, flying into rage because of texts he had seen on her phone. He believed the texts, which read, I love you and I miss you, were from another man. It wasn't until weeks after his trial had started that he realized that these were texts he had sent her months before her brutal murder. In 2019, again in August, it was the shocking and terrifying murder of 19-year-old Uinene Mkwekiana in broad daylight at a post office. When the lockdown was implemented in March 2020, women's advocacy groups raised the possible impact of having women and children locked into their homes with their abusers. Indeed, shortly after the lockdown began, several Southern African countries noted a significant uptick in the frequency of the domestic violence calls into hotlines and police stations, as well as deaths related to GBV. A pandemic within a pandemic, as described by Mrs. Grasha Macher. However, even those fears could not have predicted the report of the Gauteng Department of Health, also delivered during Women's Month, that girls between ages of 10 and 14 had given birth to 934 children between April 2020 and March 2021. Some of those pregnancies would have occurred during the lockdown when these children of school going age were at home. These statistics raise disturbing questions about who the fathers of those babies are and when and how these children fell pregnant. We must work much harder than we may have done up to now to implement agreed upon measures to deal with gender-based violence. The judiciary of South Africa will ensure, as it is required to by the Constitution, that where it deals with matters 
relating to gender-based violence, it does so in accordance with the Constitution and the law of the Republic. But the attitudes and views that create a culture that condones, normalizes, and justifies violence of any kind against women and children runs through the very fabric of South African society and culture. The constitution envisions a different kind of threat that must run through our society. That of human dignity, the achievement of equality, and the advancement of human rights and freedoms. These values are fundamental to our democracy. Until women and children can freely and fully be free from all forms of violence, that strip them of their dignity, their equality, their human worth, and their freedoms. Our democracy is not complete. Earlier on, I made the point that as the judiciary we understand very well that we derive the judicial power we have and exercise from the people of this country who have given it to us through the constitution. On Friday last week, our constitution turned 25 years old since it was signed on the 10th December 1996. It is this constitution that in section 165 provides as follows, and I quote, one, the judicial authority of the Republic is vested in the courts. Two, the courts are independent and subject only to the constitution and the law, which they must apply without fear favor or prejudice. Close quotes. Our courts are the guardians of our constitution. I believe that over the past 25 years, our courts have done very well in the performance of their role as the guardians of our constitution. This has sometimes attracted serious attacks against the judiciary. Indeed, over the past 25 years, there have been various storms that the judiciary has gone through, but it has managed to play its role to protect and uphold the constitution and the rights contained in the Bill of Rights. We do not know for certain how the next 25 years will be. But there is one thing we know. It is that the courts and the judiciary must continue to protect our constitutional democracy for the next 25 years and beyond. In this regard, I'm reminded of what President Mandela said about the Constitutional Court and democracy on the occasion of the inauguration of the Constitutional Court on the 14th February 1995. 
President Mandela had this to say about the Constitutional Court and democracy. The last time I appeared in court was to hear whether or not I was going to be sentenced to death. Fortunately for myself and my colleagues, we were not. Today, I rise not as an accused, but on behalf of the people of South Africa to inaugurate a court South Africa has never had, a court on which hinges the future of our democracy, close quotes. All our courts in the next 25 years and beyond will be required to continue to defend the Constitution, to uphold the Constitution, to protect all the rights in the Bill of Rights, to protect judicial independence, to protect the rule of law, even under difficult circumstances, when they may suffer attacks of all kinds. Nevertheless, the times that lie ahead for the country and for the judiciary will require a judiciary that is strong, a judiciary that is determined to protect our constitutional democracy, even under difficult circumstances. I am satisfied that the judiciary that we have will be up to the job. It has been an honor and a special privilege for me to present the Judiciary Annual Report for the period 1 April 2020 to 31 March 2021 to the people of South Africa. Thank you. Yes, thank you, um, Acting Chief Justice. We now move over to the question and answer session, which will be facilitated by the spokesperson for the judiciary, Mr. Nube. Over to you, Mr. Nube. Thank you, Judge President uh, Leo. Uh, colleagues in the media, uh, we are going to um, open the floor for the question and answer session. I must hasten to indicate that um, because uh, this uh, session was meant for the judiciary to account to the public, we have then allowed the members of the media who represent the public in this instance to ask the questions on the behalf of the media. I am advised that other stakeholders um, will have a different session at some point if there is a need to ask questions. So this particular session is specifically uh, for the public represented uh, by the media. I'm requesting that when you ask a question, you raise your hand, you will indicate uh, the media house you represent Please try to be brief when you ask your questions. Uh, we've allocated at least 40 minutes for this session, so it will be uh, useful if the questions are brief and to the point. Um, one question per person, we may take uh, more rounds if needs be. I will see it by the show of hands. Um, uh, I see one question uh, as and Sol here, I don't see any other hand. We will, I see Mr. Benjamin. I think we will go according to that order for now. Thank you very much. Please go ahead.
Please proceed, ma'am. The person who's, who, who, who appears as Enson here, please ask the question. You are unmuted, but we can't hear you. May I proceed to Mr. Benjamin then, in the meantime? Begizeli Benjamin, yes. please. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nube. And thank you, Justice Zondo and Justice Law for the, for the presentations. Um, Justice Zondo, I have uh, two questions um, for now. The one is the question of finalization rate. Um, we, I, I would I just like clarity on um, the time period in which the cases that are considered finalized um, are, are decided. Uh, is it in reference to the norms and standards or by any other measure? And then secondly, um, in, in, in part of your presentation, you spoke about the, the court modernization, and you also made mention of the uh, security breach on the IT systems. Uh, can you provide clarity on, on how this affected the Superior Court judiciary, uh, particularly on, on, on in, in Gauteng, where the case life system is, is already working, but also in, in the other Superior Courts? Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, uh, Acting Chief Justice. The, the, thank, thank you, Nati. Uh, let me say uh, at this stage, as everybody has heard, uh, we have got uh, other members of the leadership of the judiciary who are here. And uh, in terms of the question and answer session, we are going to, I'm going to indicate when I uh, would like other members of the uh, leadership to also come in. With regard to when our MET has considered, considered finalized, that is when at... disallowed uh, so it's the outcome it's the final outcome that uh, of the matter that uh, one looks at so a matter will not be considered to be finalized if it is just postponed because that is uh, not a decision on the actual matter and that is not also a decision about jurisdiction or any Can matters of that, that kind. So, so that 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 is when a matter is uh, is uh, is uh, is considered uh, finalized. Uh, with regard to the security breach, um, the. Although there was some uh, disturbance, uh, as I understand the position, uh, the OCJ was able to move in and do the best it could to mitigate and try and ensure that the damage was not as bad as it could have been. With regard to modernization, the heads of court have a committee that deals with modernization. And I'm going to ask Judge President Lambo, who is chairperson of that committee, uh, to deal with the issue of modernization. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Chief Justice. I hope I'm audible. Yes, you um, are. Thank, thank you very much. I think the question that was asked by Mr. Benjamin was the effect of the security breach that affected the Department of Justice, and I think you have answered it. But as the OCJ, we were never markedly affected by that breach because our services continued as usual. Um, I, I did not understand the question to want 
more on the modernization uh, aspect proper, although I can confirm what you said in your presentation, Acting Chief Justice, that uh, we remain resolute in ensuring that we use modernization and we advance the South African judiciary on the mod modernization journey to introduce more efficiencies in our processes. Um, let me stop there. Unless I've left something else, uh, I will deal with it. But thank you very much, Acting Chief Justice. Thank, th thank you, Judge President Lambo. I just want to add with regard to Mbegezili's question about when matters are finalized. I just want to indicate that uh, uh, how uh, the manner of calculating final the finalization of cases is explained in the uh, report uh, at the end where there are technical descriptions of indica indicators at the back of the report. Uh, so that can be found there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Nati. Thank you, Acting Chief Justice. Colleagues, we then come can to... I ask, can I ask my question now? Sorry, previously I was muted. Can you hear me now? Oh, yes, we can hear you, Linda. You can go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, Acting Chief Justice, uh, I just want to... There have been um, views expressed even by a former judge, about the quality of the judges on the uh, I'd like to get your view, please, on, on that, and whether you think that the existing process of electing judges through the Judicial Service Commission needs to be reformed in the light of the recent politicization of the whole process. Thank you very much. Uh, Linda, can you just repeat the quality of what? Um, there have been concerns raised about the quality of the judges on the Constitutional Court as reflected in certain judgments. And I think this was a matter of concern. Yes. Okay, we got the question. Thank you very much. Uh, Chief Justice, please allow me to take another one uh, from okay. uh, Tesri Erasmus. Please uh, uh, go ahead, ma'am. I'll then come to Ms. Rapkin. Thanks, Nati. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning to the justices. It's Des Erasmus for Daily Maverick. Um, good, morning. good morning. We have seen unprecedented attacks on the judiciary this year and um, open, open threats on the Constitutional Court and its justices. Um, I didn't, uh, you know, a cursory reading on a cursory reading of your report. I haven't seen much on that. Um, Justice Liu was talking about strategic plans for the ju judiciary. Um, will attacks or potential attacks on judges be included in this? Um, and what is in place within the current framework to deal with the kind of threats we witnessed, for example, during the July riots? Or is it simply left to SAPs? Thanks. Thank you very much, Mr. Ezri. Uh, when we come back, we'll take Ms. Sung Kim <coughs> and we'll also take Ms. Rapkin. Thank you very much. Over to you, Acting Chief Justice. Um, uh, Nati, uh is it is it linda uh, yes it's linda answer from um, yes i think case. she i think she asked a number of questions and uh, maybe she, and she was quite fast uh, maybe if she is go if she could just repeat let me understand the, 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 the her questions uh, she takes the question to us it says concerns have been raised about the about quality the, of of some of right. the judges on the constitutional court, what is your view and how can a high quality be assured? Okay, maybe let me take uh, some and I will uh, uh, refer another one maybe to Judge President Leo because there was a reference to her. Uh, the judiciary, including the judges of the constitutional court, uh, appreciate that it's important to ensure that they produce quality judgments and they most of the time get that right and produce judgments that are a product of hard work and a product of uh, serious consideration. But of course, it will happen that from time to time, 
somebody will pick up some mistakes. But on the whole, the overwhelming majority of judgments that are handed down by the Constitutional Court uh, are not judgments that have mistakes or errors. The, ju the judges continue to take various steps to try and ensure that there is quality assurance in terms of the judgments that they issue. Uh, what was the other question, uh, Nati? The men of the the other of judges? Uh, sorry, the other question was um, whether the acting chief justice believes that the process of uh, um, choosing judges through the Judicial Service Commission should be reformed in the light of the recent politicization of the process. Thank you. Uh, over the years, there have sometimes been people who have expressed views about uh, the need for changes or reforms to be made to the manner in which uh, judges are appointed in, in South Africa. And certainly, I have heard of late some people who advocate that there be reforms. But I, at this stage, would not call for any reforms in terms of the constitutional arrangement. I think that it, it is more important that we try and not tamper with the constitution uh, unless really we get to a point where it's really serious. Uh, at this stage, I would not be calling for any reform uh, in terms of the manner in which judges get appointed. Thank you, Nati. Thank you. Um, Miss uh, Yun Kim, uh, please ask your question to be followed by Miss Rapkin. Freni Rapkin. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Can you hear me? Nati, I'm sorry, Nati. I'm sorry, Nati. I think there was a question that Linda had asked, which uh, related to Jack Prison Liu. Uh, one uh, that I thought uh, I would ask Judge President Liu to deal with. Uh, I, I don't want her to think that we are ignoring her question. I don't know if you, you remember it or, or they sent it to you. Uh, I do not have that question, uh, uh, ACJ. Maybe, uh, Linda, are you still there? You can. Was there another question that was not addressed? No, there wasn't another question. Thank you very much for those oh, answers. Okay. Nike, you. it was me who asked the question um, about Judge Liu. Oh, okay. Can you please repeat that for us, uh, Um, All of my questions were regarding the um, unprecedented attacks on the justices and um, an open threat on the Constitutional Court and its justices. And I asked that um, Judge Liu spoke about the strategic plans for the judiciary and will attacks or potential attacks on, the, on justices be included in this? And um, what is in place within the current framework? to deal with the kind of threats we witnessed um, on the judiciary during the July riots. Thanks. Thank you. Um, let me say something and then maybe judge presently you can also come in. The, you are right to say that uh, there were threats uh, made security threats against the judiciary during the July unrest. Uh, the issue of the security of the judiciary was handled uh, by the state, and um, and there were discussions involving the leadership of the judiciary and uh, and the dis leadership itself conferred on what actually needed to be done. And uh, at that stage, the measures that were taken uh, were understood by the judiciary. Obviously, going forward, if there are further threats, uh, security threats, they would need to be dealt with uh, at that time. And I am of the opinion that uh, uh, 
the state would take measures to ensure that there is protection if there is the threat against the judiciary. Uh, Dr. President Leo, I don't know whether you wish to say something. Yes, the, the question was whether the security issues relating to judges are also is to included in the strategic plan. That is, uh, is the draft strategic plan. Uh, I mentioned that uh, with regard to that, uh, the strategic plan is work in progress. And if needs be, the issue relating to security of judges may be included there. We have not had an opportunity to discuss that issue. This matter has been, uh, or rather the issue relating to security uh, was being handled by the subcommittee of the heads of court that deals with security for judges. Thank you. Thank you, um, Judge President. Um, I am going to ask uh, Mr. Kim, I apologize, I said Ms. Kim, I, Mr. Kim, okay. um, uh, to yeah. take over, and then uh, Ms. Rapkin uh, to also come after Mr. Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Acting uh, Chief Justice Zondo, for your presentation. I am a special correspondent from Korea. And when I saw this, uh, the cases uh, uh, these days, uh, South Africa uh, has faced this kind of a strong, you know, measure of lockdown. So how did you overcome it in processing this judgment uh, compared with the uh, period before this lockdown? How did you overcome it? Can you uh, say more about that? And the second question is, how did you facilitate uh, the gender-based gender violence of, uh, judgment uh, in these difficult times? Did you speed up the uh, proceedings of judgment? Thank you. Th th thank you very much. <coughs> After the uh, lockdown had uh, been instituted, the judiciary, like many other sectors, in uh, business and in society had to consider how it would operate under the environment of a lockdown and with COVID-19 that uh, started last year. A decision that was made was to ensure that there would be virtual hearings that were conducted, those have continued uh, to a very large extent. And indeed, I think that uh, the South African courts are getting used to virtual hearings. Uh, you may be aware, you may or may not be aware that the Constitutional Court has been having its hearings uh, virtually uh, for a very long time since the uh, lock institution of the lockdown. And the Supreme Court of Appeal also hears their appeal uh, virtually. Uh, so that is what uh, happened. But also the leadership of the judiciary issued directives to deal with issues of uh, COVID-19 and the access of people to court premises and to court rooms to ensure that there would be compliance with uh, health protocols. But as far as the handing down of judgments, uh, to a very large extent, it was based on uh, virtual hearings. Thank you. Uh, I mentioned I mentioned Nati, I mentioned uh, the directives that were issued by the leadership of the judiciary. Um, the Chief Justice issued directives and issued a directive that enabled judges president to also issue directives that would apply in the, within their jurisdiction. And the OCJ arranged for virtual platforms 
that uh, uh, would enable the provision of tools so that there would be uh, virtual hearings. Uh, there were uh, computers that were arranged to enable all of this to happen. Wi-Fi was extended. Bandwidth also was expanded. There were ICT licenses that were arranged. So there was quite a lot of work that was done by the OCJ and the judiciary to make sure that uh, COVID-19 and lockdown did not hamper access to justice more than uh, it could be accepted in our country. So all of these measures were taken to make sure that uh, the courts were able to proceed in the circumstances. Thank you very much, Acting Chief Justice. May I first request Mr. Kim and uh, Mr. Benjamin to lower their hands unless they intend to ask uh, other questions. Ms. Uh, Rapkin, over to you. Thank you so much, Nati. Um, good morning, Justices. Um, I have two, two questions, is that okay? It is an order, ma'am. Thank you. The, the first question relates to the reserve judgments. Um, in last year's annual report, there was um, information given on judgments that had been reserved for longer than six months. I have had a quick look at this year's report, and I don't see that information. What I see is judgments that have not been handed down within three months. Is it possible to get those that have been um, reserved longer than six months in, in the same way that we did in last year's annual report. That's the, the first question. My second question is that I'm looking here at page nine of, of the annual report that refers to um, the elimination of a backlog on, on complaints to the Judicial Conduct Committee. Um, I have had opportunity to look at the Judicial Service Commission's annual report for the same period, which doesn't mention this clearing of a backlog. In fact, I have a number of questions following up from the JSC's annual report regarding Judicial Conduct Committee, complaints to the Judicial Conduct Committee, and wanted to take the opportunity, since this is referred to in this report as well, to put them here. One of them relates to a complaint that was laid in January of this year um, against the Chief Justice, the former Chief Justice, about a, a, a prayer about a vaccine that apparently has gone nowhere. If I can just find out what happened with that complaint. Um, in general, I wanted to ask the, the Acting Chief Justice whether um, the way in which these complaints are dealt with and reported back in the Judicial Service Commission annual report is fulfilling the legislative mandate of the JSC Act in the sense that this is the first we are hearing about a clearing of a backlog and we can't see from the JSC's annual reports the progress of complaints through the system because all the annual reports say is that this is the number of complaints that have been received and these are the number that have been finalized in that particular year. It doesn't actually deal with the backlog and this is my question is why not and, and whether this is what is conceived of and, 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 and envisaged by the legislation. Thank you. Uh. But thank you very, very much. Uh, with regard to judgments, with regard to judgments, uh, they are published reserve judgments that are older than six months. They are published in the website every six months. Uh, so it ought to be possible for anybody to access, access them. Uh, so that information should be possible to, 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 to find. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Thank you. Yes. 
And uh, then there was the question of what happened to the complaint that was lodged against the former Chief Justice. Uh, I don't have an immediate answer on that, but that information can be given to you um, after this by the Secretariat of the, Co of the Judicial Conduct Committee. Um, I, I know that, uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, the way in which uh, or the, whatever backlog may have been there in regard to complaints against judges a few years ago, a lot of that backlog has been taken care of and that, generally speaking, now, except maybe for a, f a very few, generally speaking, complaints against judges uh, get dealt with uh, very frequently. One of the things that uh, uh, is responsible for that is that uh, from about a year ago, the heads of court, the judges, president, and other heads of court were involved. They got involved in the adjudication of complaints against judges because many complaints against judges are really complaints that get disposed of without even the Judicial Conduct Committee asking the judge consent to, to comment because a lot of them are just complaints uh, from people who are aggrieved by the outcome of their cases. Uh, but of course, there are other cases that uh, uh, are certainly not frivolous and uh, require proper attention. Thank you. Thank you, SCJ. Um, please, loyal your hands, uh, colleagues, if you have no further questions. I note there's Mr. Tsejo Moare who wants to ask a question. Before I allow him to speak, Acting Chief Justice, I've received a question from uh, Mr. Vianney Green of SAPC News. The question is, um, does it not worry the Acting Chief Justice the fact that the President is delaying to make appointments for the vacancies in the Constitutional Court, despite the fact that the JSC has submitted its recommendations as required by Section 174. The second question is, doesn't the delay by the President in making the appointment, including for the lower court, I assume is referring to the high courts, as advised by the JSC, fly in the face of Section 2 of the Constitution? Uh, this is from Mr. Vianney Green from SABC. Well, the let me take the first question about uh, appointment, the filling of uh, two vacancies in the Constitutional Court that I think uh, Mr. Green is talking about arising out of the interviews that were conducted by the JSC uh, at the beginning of October. Uh, my understanding is that the President uh, is uh, still engaged or has been engaged in the process of consultation that is required by the Constitution. And um, that uh, uh, that process uh, had not been finalized recently. It may be that it is finalized as of today, but I'm aware that it had not been finalized uh, um, a while a while back, so I am confident that, uh, in all probability, the president uh, would be making uh, uh, his decision known uh, in due course. So the interviews were in October, and uh, we have had November. We are early in December. Uh, compared to other occasions which have happened in the past, I think we have had um, much longer delays. Based on uh, my understanding of what is happening in terms of the consultation process, uh, I believe that uh, the president will be making his decision quite soon. Uh, the appointments of uh, judges in the other courts, such as the various divisions of the uh, 
of the High Court. Uh, I am not sure uh, what the delay is, uh, what is causing the delay, but um, I hope that the President uh, will uh, make the appointments uh, without uh, any further delay. Thank you. Thank you, Acting Chief Justice. I'm sorry, Martin. May I just add some information to the question that was asked about complaints? I am looking here at the Judicial Service Commission annual report for 2020-2021 at uh, page 13. It says, for the period under review, the committee received 162 complaints lodged against judges in the various superior courts. Of this number, 81 complaints were resolved, while 81 are still pending. In 2019-2020 financial year, the committee dealt with 99 complaints, of which 70 were finalized, while 29 were outstanding. The numbers reflected above indicate a 64% increase of the number of complaints received by the committee for the 2020-2021 financial year. So the issue of the numbers is dealt with in that report. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Acting Chief Justice. Uh, Ms. Tsejo uh, I apologize. I said, Mr. I apologize once more. Over to you. No problem. Thank you so much, Nati. Good morning, Justices. Um, uh, you're saying in your report, Acting Chief Justice, that um, 11 judges were discharged from active service. Can you possibly give us reasons why they were discharged? Um, and if it's for disciplinary issues, do we know? Can you just let us know what exactly the reasons are for them being released from their service? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. I think that <clears throat> I think that the problem is the terminology uh, uh, it is charged in the in the normal uh, meaning would be understood by ordinary people to mean dismissed. But in the context of the judiciary, when a, a judge retires, for example, uh, in terms of uh, the legislation, uh, you talk about that judge being discharged. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they've been dismissed for misconduct or anything of that kind. So when they retire, the term used is discharged from active service. Thank you, Chief Justice. Uh, Mr. Benjamin, I see you want to ask another question. Uh, I'll give you a chance. And also, Ms. Desri Erasmus. And lastly, Ms. Rapkin. Go for it, Mr. Benjamin. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Mnube, and, and thank you, uh, Justice Sando, for the responses. I, I have a, a quick follow-up to the question on, on the reports um, from the JSC on, on conduct. Um, you mentioned that there were some uh, cases that were uh, misconduct cases that were pending um, from the previous year um, and that were not carried over to the next year. So, for example, in a particular year, the JSC report will say there were X many cases that were uh, uh, submitted, X many were resolved, and then there were X many that, were, that are pending. But in the following year, it doesn't say of those that were pending in the previous year, they have now been finalized or in the nature of in, in which they were finalized. And I think uh, another uh, question related to the, to the conduct report and the JSC report is that it doesn't really speak of the nature of the misconduct uh, uh, that is um, uh, it, uh, discussed in the report. So it's very difficult to tell whether or not this misconduct is, as you mentioned, a frivolous complaints related to court judgments, for example, or much more serious complaints that relate to, to uh, serious instances of misconduct. So I think that's where the, the clarity uh, question came from. And, and perhaps I would also ask, as, as the chairperson of the Judicial Conduct Committee, are you satisfied that um, that committee and the way it operates is transparent enough that the public can be assured that 
judges are held accountable um, uh, and, and they uphold integrity. And then a uh, last question is on the relationship with the other arms of state, particularly parliament and the executive. In the report, it is mentioned that um, the judiciary has proposed a, a model of institutional independence to the executive, but there has been no movement from the executive. My question is, uh, what measures has the uh, 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 judiciary taken to move the executive forward on that institutional independence model? And, and how long has, has that movement not taken place from the executive? And then uh, lastly, on, on parliament, um, does the judiciary believe that it is accountable to parliament? Does it have any obligation to um, meet and, and report to parliament in any way? Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there is any colleague who wishes to answer any of these questions, I'm quite happy to allow uh, colleagues who may wish to deal with some of these questions and I uh, can deal with whatever uh, nobody deals with. Uh, uh, colleagues, JPs, uh, uh, members, heads of court, is there, are there any colleagues who wish to answer some of the questions? Okay, uh, I, I will, I will uh, deal with them. I think one of your first questions related to a, a concern that in the one year, the report relating to uh, complaints against judges or judicial conduct would give certain information, but in the following year, there would be no follow-up or connection to say what happened to uh, whatever percentage, for example, of cases that may have, might not have been finalized in the previous year. To the extent that that may be the position, uh, that should be easy to correct because uh, there can't be any intention to hide anything. So I think that uh, you must feel free to write to the Secretariat of the uh, Judicial Conduct Committee if you would like to uh, pursue that matter, but there cannot be any intention to hide information. To the extent that your other question uh, raises a concern that the report does not disclose the nature of the uh, complaint or the conduct complained of against the judge. It may well be that uh, there the might not be any warrant to disclose that if the matter falls under uh, frivolous complaints. But obviously, if it is a, a serious uh, complaint, uh, it would be known. Maybe let me explain uh, how these complaints are dealt with. In terms of the Judicial Service Commission, uh, Service Commissions Act, complaints that uh, are lodged by the public against judges fall generally uh, under three categories. The one category is those complaints that are that can be dismissed summarily by the Judicial Conduct Committee or by the chairperson of the Judicial Conduct Committee because they are seen as frivolous or they are hypothetical or they constitute a complaint about uh, the merits of a judgment or order. Uh, there may be another category. Um, probably not much purpose would be served by uh, including all of uh, the nature of the complaint in regard to those because there are a lot of those, but really they fall into that category. There are few cases which fall under one of both of the other categories. The one category are complaints which are viewed as serious 
but not serious enough that they could lead to uh, the impeachment of the judge if he or she was found guilty. Mm -hmm. So those are complaints where it is thought that if uh, the judge concerned were to be found guilty, uh, he or she would be given a warning uh, or some other uh, sanction, but one that doesn't go uh, to impeachment. Then there is the category of the more serious, uh, serious ones, which could lead to uh, impeachment. I, I think all those that fall under that, they get known publicly. Uh, these frivolous ones uh, don't really attract any media atten attention. Um, well, I think that uh, uh, with regard to the matter of the institutional independence and the issue of the model, uh, as you have indicated, we have indicated that uh, discussions were held, but uh, there came a point where no move movement was uh, was seen from the executive. So, in a way, when you have discussions or negotiations, it happens that you reach a point where uh, the two sides can move forward because they don't uh, uh, they have an issue that they can't uh, overcome between themselves. The one sees matters in a certain way, the other one sees it in a different way. Uh, and it is quite some time back that uh, that point was reached. But the judiciary uh, can't use anything against uh, the executive other than the power of persuasion. Uh, so, so, so that 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 is uh, where the position is. But uh, you you may find it advisable to approach the executive and uh, find out uh, what is happening. But uh, uh, there certainly uh, is no movement uh, at, at this stage. With regard to Parliament, the relationship between the judiciary and Parliament, uh, the judiciary and leadership of the judiciary does get uh, uh, does have meetings from time to time with the Portfolio Committee on uh, Justice and Correctional Services or Justice and Constitutional Development on matters of mutual interest. Uh, but as the former Chief Justice uh, made it clear, there is no provision in the constitution or in any law that uh, requires the judiciary to account to parliament. Uh, so the position is simply that we have Judiciary Day where we release uh, the judiciary annual report in the way we have done today because we believe we should account to the public. And uh, I am aware that nobody has been able to point uh, any provision in the constitution or the law that uh, requires the judiciary to account to parliament. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chief, Chief Justice. Um, Ms. Tesri and Ms. Rapkin. Thanks, Nati. Um, yeah, I was also going to ask on the um, institutional independence, so thank you for answering that. Uh, and um, so I'm just going to throw in this question now so I don't, um, don't waste your time. Um, have, how many reports have you had this year, sir, of, uh, from judges of attempts of political interference in cases? Thank you. Uh, did you say attempts at interference with judicial functions? Yes, um, political interference, particularly in cases and also in, ju in um, judicial functions. Oh, 
I, I'm, I'm not aware of any. Do so would they, sorry, would they, would, sorry, would they come to you, sir? You, 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 I, I, are you talking about complaints that would come from judges? Yes. Uh, that, for example, a politician tried to interfere with, with judicial functions? Is that yes. what you have in mind? Yes. Oh, well, I would imagine that uh, uh, judges would inform me if there was such a thing. And um, I certainly have, I'm not aware of any, there's no judge who has ever um, uh, made such a complaint to me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tezri, and thank you, Acting Chief Justice. Uh, Freni? Um, thanks, Nati. I'm mostly covered by Mbegezeli. Um, I was just trying to follow up to explain what he said. Uh, I think I am answered. I just wanted to give one example to the Acting Chief Justice, um, just to make the points um, about the lack of information. In the 2017-18 JC annual report, it is mentioned that there were four there, that the JCC recommended judicial conduct tribunals in respect to four judges for long outstanding judgments. It was the first I personally had ever seen. I did put in a question to the JSC as to what happened with those, with that recommendation, and I'm yet to receive an answer. Um, this is what I was referring to in terms of follow through as to what happened from the year before. So in the in the following annual report the next year, there's no mention of that as to what happened with that. So we just left unclear as to what happened. And this is where the concern comes from um, in terms of when a matter, when a complaint is not finalized within the reporting year, there's no follow up the years subsequently as to what happened with those pending complaints. Well, th th thank you, thank you very much. Um, I, I, I wonder whether you, you, you wouldn't mind uh, uh, sending another an email to the Secretariat of the Judicial Conduct Committee and uh, mentioning that uh, you raised these questions with me at this uh, forum and that I, you said that you had raised, you had asked certain questions and you did not receive any response and you just ask those questions again and, um, and uh, uh, I hope that they can uh, attend to it and uh, I hope I can, uh, uh, if you don't get a response, Maybe you can uh, send send uh, uh, communication to the to to the office of the chief justice, and uh, uh, we can uh, try and make sure that you get information. There is absolutely, uh, as far as I'm concerned, there is absolutely no reason uh, or intention not to share information such as that. Uh, there, 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 there may be some challenges, but. Uh, I, I am sure that it's information that can easily be given and uh, it can be given. So, so I, I would suggest that you, if you don't mind, just uh, communicate with the Secretariat of the, uh, the Judicial Conduct Committee again. And if you don't get a response, try and uh, uh, alert me to, to, to it and uh, I will... Uh, talk to the Secretariat and uh, uh, there is no reason why you should not get a response. Thank you so much, Acting Chief Justice. I will do so. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so Chief much, Justice. Acting Chief. Oh, Chief. Sir. Sir, Mr. Mnubi, I just want to follow oh. up on what the Acting Chief just said and those complaints raised mm. by Ms. Rapkin Naika. Uh, mm. Acting Chief Justice, I can confirm that those four complaints about long-reserved judgments uh, were resolved and were finalized by the Judicial Service Commission. Um, I, I just can't give the details thereof. Perhaps when Ms. Rapkin Naika contacts the JSC, they will tell her exactly how they were resolved. But I can confirm here 
that those yes. were the first, they related to judges coming from the Houghton division. Okay. JP, I'm not Ms. Rabkin Naika. I'm just Ms. Rabkin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry about that, uh, Franny. Sorry, please forgive me. That's okay. I would I'll be very honored to be Ms. Rabkin Naika, but I'm not. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Ms. Uh, Rabkin. Um, I just wanted to say that um, we the, the judiciary day is indeed about the judicial performance. I don't want us colleagues to be distracted. Uh, without necessarily protecting the acting chief justice, but he wanted to uh, present the annual report, which he has. Uh, I'm sure he wants to take more questions on the content of the uh, report as it, it relates to the performance. I see uh, Mr. Kim is back. Sh shall we take uh, another uh, question yes. from him? Thank you very much. Okay, because my second question was not replied, I think, uh, uh, I think, uh, Chief Justice Zondo, uh, how about uh, what what kind of uh, measures did you take to facilitate uh, the gender-based violence uh, related uh, cases? And the first one, the, also though I, I want an additional answer for my first question. Despite the lockdown, uh, did you accomplish the performance target of uh, the year, the fiscal year, uh, compared with the previous year, uh, despite these difficulties? There was no difficulties in virtual uh, judgment? I, I'm sorry, Mr. Kim. Uh, yes. I don't know whether it's the network or what it is, or maybe you're speaking too fast. I'm not sure. <laughs> Can you ask one question at a time and just ask it slowly? Because uh, I didn't hear, I had some parts of your questions, but uh, not a complete question. So maybe uh, take one uh, at a time. Yes, let me, let me assist. Uh, sorry, Mr. Okay. Kim, let me assist because I think it's your network. I understood the first question to be, what is it that the judiciary did to facilitate the resolution of gender-based violence? Uh, the second question was, how did the judiciary uh, manage to perform and achieve, if it did, its targets during the lockdown uh, 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 in the past year? Did I get them right, Mr. Kim? Yes, correct. Yes, compared with the previous year, did you accomplish the target of the performance uh, uh, compared with okay. the, you know, the previous year, despite the lockdown? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, hey, it's difficult to hear. <laughs> uh, but I think uh, uh, there was the question of I think how we, the judiciary in South Africa, managed to resolve uh, gender-based violence. Uh, is it during lockdown? Uh, I'm not sure that I followed, but I can I can just say uh, that uh, we 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 I mean uh, gender-based violence continues in South Africa and uh, it is quite high. Um, many people in the country are very concerned about it and uh, the judiciary is concerned about it. The judiciary would play its part in terms of simply performing its functions uh, in terms of cases that come before the courts, but uh, also there are sexual offenses courts that are, are there which uh, are, are used. There are cases, there are domestic violence courts. Uh, so the judiciary will do everything that it can provided for in the legal framework to try and make sure that issues of gender-based violence are dealt with uh, properly from their side. And um, the other question, I must confess, I tried to follow, but uh, I'm struggling. Yes, I, I think the T acting Chief Justice did respond to the question in his presentation, Mr. Kim, when he On the earlier to, one. Yes, when, when the Chief, acting Chief Justice was referring to uh, what were the majors put in place? Yes. yes, maybe okay. the acting, yes. I, yes. I, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm not sure. No, I think you are right. Yeah, I think you are right, yeah. Yes. Um, um, we, we, 
We are at the end. Is that JP Lefodi? Yes. I, I, I thought perhaps I needed to say something about the question which has just been raised in relation to what is it which we are doing to address uh, gender violence matters. I am aware of my colleagues in various divisions, heads of court, who from time to time will have meetings with the role planners from the NPA uh, to ensure that they specifically give a preference uh, to gender violence matters and prioritize them. And, and I think that is what is happening because it's a matter of great concern uh, to, to, to everyone. And um, I, I see it working in other divisions and in our divisions as well. Uh, that coordination with uh, the, the role planners from the NPA is quite very important. Thanks. Thank you, Judge President. Uh, Thank you, uh, Acting Chief Justice. I think I'm going to hand over back to uh, Judge President Liu at this point in time. I don't see any questions. We allocated 45 minutes, we're way over that anyways. But I don't see any hands. Over to you, uh, Judge President Liu. She's, she's muted. Yeah, she's muted. Unmute yourself, uh, Judge President. Thank you. Um, thank you, um, ACJ and Mr. Nati. Uh, we now move on to the uh, vote of thanks, and I will request Judge President of Houting, JP Malambo, to uh, deal with the issue relating to vote of thanks. Thank you very much, uh, JP Leo, as a our facilitator's leadership uh, today. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. And thank you very much, Acting Chief Justice, for also allowing me to say a few words uh, in a vote of thanks. I think I would be remiss if I do not specifically mention the presence or attendance of the leadership of Parliament and its various committees uh, to this event. Uh, I want to thank them very much for uh, taking the event seriously and attending, as well as members of the executive and uh, the directors general who are in attendance. I want to thank them as well for attending this event. The Secretary General of the Office of the Chief Justice, she is the, as they say in the US, the head honcho who makes us proud in the Office of the Chief Justice in the things she does and the team she leads. So, Secretary General, thank you very much for all your efforts. I also want to thank the leadership of the judiciary uh, in its various levels, that is Superior Courts, Specialist Courts, and the Magistrates Courts, for attending this event. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I want to emphasize one thing, that this event is about us as a judiciary accounting about what we do, especially our performance. And I think the Acting Chief Justice was very clear in uh, setting out what the performance targets were in those areas that he covered and what our achievements have been. And uh, this is how we think we remain relevant for South African society, how we intend to make sure that the promise of our constitution remains alive in the minds and hearts of South Africans. So Acting Chief Justice, thank you very much for ensuring that this day comes to pass. I also want to echo some of the sentiments you raised about court modernization uh, being my pet hose. I think in the judiciary in South Africa, we have realized that IT is a serious enabler and that the strategic use of IT initiatives will assist us in performing even higher than how we are doing. Because if you look at the increasing workload of all the courts, the consequence would be that more judges and more magistrates would be appointed and would be the infrastructure, physical infrastructure, such as courts and court buildings, courtrooms should be built. But if we embrace IT properly, we don't have to go to those extents because IT has solutions 
that can be strategically put to use to ensure that we are able to deal with the workloads that continue to rise in our courts and that our performance goes even higher. So thank you very much overall to everyone who has attended this meeting, Mr. Nube, lastly, thank you very much for facilitating the engagement with uh, the people from the media who you deal with almost on a daily basis. But uh, overall, Acting Chief Justice, I'm happy as head of court that uh, the judiciary is on track in performing and continuing to perform. And with those few words, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to say the vote of thanks. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Before uh, Judge President Liu says something, I just want to say something that uh, I should have said earlier in thanking the Secretary General and her team to announce that due to their hard work, the OCJ has once again achieved a clean audit outcome. We thank her and her team for that. Thank you. Thank you, um, ACJ and JP Mlambo for your word of thanks. Uh, we have come to the conclusion of this program and I just wish to announce that the report is available uh, uh, on the OCJ website. Uh, you can access it. And the speech uh, by the acting Chief Justice will also be published there. Uh, I thank you all. And as I've said, we have come to the end of this program, of this special occasion. And please stay safe and have a prosperous and blessed New Year, Christmas and New Year. I thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.